good evening welcome all of you to this webinar conducted by professor academy i am proud to say you know in the last concluded net exam june 2024 our students in huge numbers you know passed net exam with ease and let's go to today's webinar it's titled ugc net english poetry appreciation why this topic because in net exam we have a separate unit called poetry because we have 10 units unit 1 drama unit 2 poetry then unit 3 uh, fiction and short story 4 non fictional prose 5 language and linguistics and 6 we have english in india then 7 cultural studies a separate unit then 8 literary criticism 9 literary theory 10 research methods so definitely we can expect some questions related to poetry unit 2 so we get now these days we get a passage from prose or a passage from uh, critical works we also get a poem for appreciation uh, for five marks and sometimes we do not get uh, a you know a poet you know get poetic lines but we get specific questions related to poetic terms okay so what we are going to do today is that we will look at some of the aspects of poetry right so with this we'll start but if you are new to you know preparing for net english so what you can do you can subscribe to professor academy english a channel exclusively for uh, english literature where we have a playlist called webinars uh, we have already done two webinars exclusively on this topic the uh, first one is scratching from net so if you are just starting uh, your preparation maybe uh, you can listen to this video uh, this webinar where i talk about how you can start your preparation from scratch i also introduce the essential books you need for uh, preparation and also some of the strategies for beginners as well as advanced students then the next webinar the same website you know uh, you, our youtube channel so you have the link here this is titled uh, trends and strategies some of the recent trends and strategies in net exam i i discuss indian literature uh, how to tackle chronology based questions and emerging fields so this is the webinar all about and before i move on you know sometimes people worry about percentile cut off and all the other things see what i tell my students is very simple see do not bother about do not crack your head over this numbers keep it very simple so you have paper 1 and 2 paper 1 you have 50 questions each 2 marks so totally 100 marks paper 2 100 questions each 2 marks totally 200 marks so 3 hours you are going to write for 300 marks there is no negative mark no break keep it simple paper 1 try to get over or around 35 questions right i'm talking about number of questions i'm not talking about marks i'm not talking about percentage percentile cut off nothing do not bother about all these things they will take care of themselves these numbers will take care of themselves if you focus only on number of questions so out of 50 try to get 35 uh, in paper 1 paper 2 try to get around 65 see totally 100 right 100 questions so if you are able to crack 100 questions definitely you will pass net if you are able to crack few more questions definitely you will get jr and it depends on category sometimes if you if you go beyond 85 or 90 depends on your category let's not talk about all this category and stuff aim for 35 in paper 1 65 in paper 2 that will do and do not bother about percentile and cut off so if you are if you stick to this plan definitely you you know you will pass net that's what i tell my students and they focus on this one and next uh, uh, important one you know these days uh, if you write uh, if you appear for this exam net you have three categories one for assistant professorship you qualify in assistant professorship or jrf or phd so it depends on uh, depends upon number of questions you crack the basic one is phd a certain uh, cut off so in the last june 2024 exam if you qualified in just phd 
uh, no, you didn't qualify in assistant professorship or JRP. Do not bother. The upcoming in the upcoming net exam, uh, you can pass uh, assistant professorship and also in uh, also JRP. So we are offering uh, one of our best uh, one that is in the last exam, June 2024. If you qualified in PhD, you know just PhD only. You know, just to send your scorecard to our team and you can avail yourself of 50% uh, offer. So if you just passed in PhD only, then uh, use this offer. Uh, it's available for next few weeks. So use it immediately. Okay. So with this, let's go to uh, today's topic. See, when it comes to poetry appreciation, definitely you will get a question from figures of speech. So whenever they give poetic lines, you know, for analysis, you get one question, sure question from figures of speech. So let's talk about some of the figures of speech. Uh, number one, can anyone tell me what the figure of speech used in this line? This line is from Keats' Ode on a Gratian Urn. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. This line comes towards the end of the poem where the urn itself says, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. You know, if you know, Please uh, give your answer in the comment section. Okay. Or else, no worries, we are going to discuss. So, and one more question. So, when it comes to Keats, Keats wrote most of his, I mean, six of his famous odes in a particular year. Which year? You can also mention that year. And the figure of speech used in this line, beauty is truth, truth, beauty, is actually chiasmus. CH. I-A-S-M-U-S, chiasmus. What is chiasmus? Chiasmus refers to the inversion of the order of words in successive phrases similar in syntax. Look at it. Beauty is the truth. In the very next phrase, it is inverted. The word order is inverted. Truth is beauty. So that should be the complete one. Beauty is the truth. Truth is beauty. So this happens, this inversion happens back to back in successive phrases. And they look similar. The syntax, the syntactic structure looks uh, in a structure, they look similar. So if you have this one, this is called chiasmus. Okay. A very famous uh, figure of speech often used uh, in net exams. Uh, I think uh, it, it comes in options, a lot of options. Okay. Beauty is the truth, truth, beauty. So if you remember any line which uh, employs this chiasmus, let me know. Uh, especially one of the famous lines from Shakespeare's uh, famous play, Macbeth. So what is that line where the witches uh, use this uh, chiasmus, inversion of the uh, order of words? So let me know. So this is chiasmus. Next, let's look at uh, lines from Pope's mock epic, The Rape of the Lock. So we have this one. Does sometimes counsel take and sometimes so what is the figure of speech used in this line so let me give you a clue so you have a verb called take and this single verb goes with two nouns counsel and t but in two different meanings and let me also ask you another question in this uh, mock epic the rape of the lock which english monarch is mentioned especially uh, related to this particular line who takes, you know, counsel, sometimes tea here. Uh, that queen uh, came to the throne, the English throne in 1702 and she died in 1714. So I have given you some clues. Find out the name of the Q, uh, queen uh, who is mentioned in uh, the rape of the lock. Definitely not Queen Victoria because she comes much later. Not Queen Elizabeth is... Yes, uh, Yes, good. Uh, Mani Selvi and others, Hari Priya. Queen Anne, A N N E, Queen Anne. So she is the one who is taking counsel. I mean, she meets at Hampton Court uh, in this particular poem, where she discusses politics with the with others, and she also takes tea, right? So we have a single verb, but this single verb goes with two nouns in two different senses. So if you use this kind, you know, this kind of uh, strength structure, then it's called zugma. 
Z E U G M A. Zugma simply refers to the you know applying a single word to two other words in different senses, different meanings. So the word take, take counsel means take advice, you discuss. Take tea, you drink tea. But this is a different context. This is a different context, different senses. So this is called Zugma, very unique uh, figure of speech. Okay. Yes, I'm getting answers uh, for this first one. Fair is foul, foul is fair from Macbeth. Yes, in that line, we have chiasmus used. Thank you. Next, let's uh, discuss some of the questions uh, from earlier net exams. So this is from December 2012. Robert Graves in Broken Images ends thus. He in a new confusion of his understanding, I, in a new understanding of my confusion. The figure of speech used here is option A, chiasmus, B, catacrisis, C A T A C H R E S A S, C, inversion, D, zugma. So, which one are you going to choose? See, first understand he in a new confusion of his understanding. See, the exact opposite. The word order is inverted. I in a new understanding of my confusion. So the answer is very easy, which we discussed just now. Answer is A, chiasmus. So chiasmus, as I told you before, so you have a sentence structure whose word order is immediately inverted, you know, back to back. And they look similar when it comes to syntax. He in a new confusion of his understanding. I in a new understanding of my confusion. This is also an example of chiasmus. So this is from December 2012 net exam. Okay. Then next. So this is from July 2018. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the figure of speech characterized by Repetition of words or group of words at the beginning of consecutive sentences is called. See, in the question itself, the question setter has given the definition. If you have poetic lines, each line begins with a particular phrase or a word. So that's the repetition. Repetition of words or group of words. So in this, uh, in these lines, we have the first line in every. Next line in every. In every. So at the beginning of consecutive sentences, so each line begins with a similar phrase or word. Then what is the figure of speech used? Option A, apostrophe, B, anaphora, C, incremental repetition, D, alliteration. Definitely it's not alliteration, we know that. Apostrophe, if you say, what do you mean by apostrophe? Apostrophe is uh, you are invoking someone, you are speaking to someone who is not present. Right? Oh, West Wind. If I say, oh, West Wind, I'm addressing someone or uh, an inanimate, inanimate object. That is apostrophe. Right? So, yes. Answer B, anaphora. Anaphora. That's the answer. A-N-A-P-H-O-R-A. -A. So, anaphora is, so we have a set of poetic lines, each beginning with a similar word or phrase. So, that is anaphora. So, you can check out epiphora. E P I P H O R A. So almost the opposite. You know, something that comes at the end of consecutive sentences. Okay. So check out Epiphora. Next one. This is from June 2020. Metaphor differs from simile in that. So you ha I have four uh, reasons or explanations. So how does a metaphor differ from a simile? Option A. A comparison in metaphor is usually explicit, whereas in simile it is implicit. B. A comparison in metaphor is usually implicit, whereas in simile it is explicit. C. Neither metaphor nor simile is rooted in comparison. D. Simile involves superimposition, while metaphor involves comparison. See, when you get questions like this, try to eliminate. The first process is eliminate. See, option A and B almost look similar, except few changes. So definitely you get the answer. Uh, answer should be either A or B. You can easily eliminate C and D because when you say metaphor or simile, they involve comparison. 
All right. So eliminate C and D. Answer is A or B. So which is implicit? Implicit in the sense indirect. It's not direct. Explicit is very direct. So answer is B. So metaphor, uh, you know, what is the definition of metaphor? Metaphor is a is an indirect comparison, implicit. Simile is a direct comparison. If I say she looks like a rose. So I'm stating something directly. It's a simile. So we have markers like like the word like. So metaphor, she is a rose. What is implied? She is young, she is beautiful. These meanings are implied. When, when it comes to simile, which is, uh, you know, everything is stated openly, directly. So that's the difference. It's a very simple question uh, from June 2020 exam. Maybe this is good. This question is a bit complicated, but use elimination. This is from 2020. Which among the following are true about the figure of speech? So you have a list. List first. Let's go through the list. We have a figures based on sound can be called paranoia. So paranoia. Sorry. P a r o n o m a s i a. Is it true? Okay. B figures based on construction can be called zugma. C figures based on imagination can be called irony. D. Figures based on association, chiasmus. E. Figures based on indirectness, euphemism. So, go through this. Then you have, choose the correct answer from the options given below. Option A. A, B and E only. Or B, A, B and C only. C, B, C and D only. D, C, D and E only. What you can do? First, try to, you know, eliminate. What I'm saying, if you know the meaning of the word, uh, meaning of this figure of speech, paranomasia. So what is paranomasia? Or at least, you know, zugma, you know, chiasmus. We discuss these two figures of speech. Do you think they are right? Chiasmus is more to do with inversion of word order. But it is defined as figures based on association. Definitely, it's not true. Chiasmus is not true because association is more to do with metonymy. It has nothing to do with association. Chiasmus is more to do with inversion of word order. So, D is not correct. Now, we can eliminate two options. Option D and C are eliminated. Why? Because it involves D. Then we have D here. So, eliminate C and eliminate D. Okay, now you are left with A and B. So look at A and B. We have two similar things, A and B, in the sense, figure based on sound, paranomasia, figure uh, based on construction, zugma. So we have to find, you know, in option A, E only, then option B, C only. Now you have to de decide which is right, E or C. Just imagine, uh, I mean, do you think imagination is a characteristic feature of irony? What is an irony? You say something, the exact opposite is the one you mean. For instance, uh, take Julius Caesar by Shakespeare, where Antony says, Brutus is an honorable man. Brutus is an honorable man. He keeps saying that, but he means the exact opposite. Brutus is not an honorable man. That is irony. You say something, you mean the exact opposite, that is irony. So it has nothing to do with imagination, right? And what about uh, euphemism? Euphemism, you use polite terms for uh, harsh ones. So it means you are not saying something directly, you say something indirectly. So that is indirectness. So if you know this, then answer is A. So let's go through this. Number one. Figures based on sound, paranomasia. So another, anyone knows, uh, paranomasia is a technical term for a simple concept, which, which also starts with the letter P, is something with the homophones. So kind of a word play. Anyone? It's a word play. If I say sun, sun, S-O-N, S-U-N. So it's more pun, word play, right? Pun. Another term for pun is paranomasia. 
So when you if you understand this, paranomasia means a pun because a pun works uh, based on sound, similar sounds. So answer is A is right. Then B is also right. Figures based on construction, zugma. So we have one word, especially uh, or particularly a verb, which goes with two nouns in different senses. That is zugma. Uh, this is wrong. Irony is not based on imagination. Then chiasmus is not based on association. Euphemism is based on indirectness. But euphemism is not a figure of speech. But anyway, this is the answer. A, B, and C, uh, sorry, A, B, and E only. So this is the correct answer. So this is how you get questions these days, you know, in net exam, where you have to know most of the, you know, prominently used figures of speech. Okay. Uh, if you want to know uh, some of the major figures of speech, uh, go through this list. Oxymoron, transferred epithet, uh, light audits, L-I-T-O-T-S, hyperbole, apostrophe, pathetic fallacy. Uh, here is a question for you. Who coined the term uh, pathetic fallacy? Anyone? The term was coined by John S. Priya, right? Ruskin. John Ruskin. Good. Next, onomatopoeia. Synecdoche, metonymy. So what you can do, you can look up these terms in these books. One a glossary of literary terms by M. H. Abrams. Uh, then a dictionary of literary terms and literary theory by J. A. Cutter. So you can look up each and every term in this book. You can also read about the examples given there. Even sometimes you have to understand how question setters take questions for net exam or any competitive exam. They have to use the standard books. And sometimes they give the exact examples given in these books. Who knows? Sometimes we may get the examples from these books themselves. Then that will be easy for us. So look up all these terms in these books. Next to section, imagery. What is imagery when it comes to poetry or literature in general? See, when you read any literary work, you know, the moment you read a phrase or a sentence, something that appeals to your eyes, you know, you are able to imagine what is being described there. It appeals to your eyes. So you are able to imagine or you are able to smell. So you are transported to a new world visually or in terms of smell or some other means. So that is called imagery. The most famous is visual imagery because the moment you read something, you are able to visualize what is being described there. So that is imagery. But let's uh, you know, go through this, maybe read these uh, lines from Irish poet Seamus Heaney's famous poem, Digging. To scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. So here, when we read, loving the cool hardness in our hands. So we are able to touch. So when we read this line, we are able to touch. You know, the sense here is touching. You know, we touch the raw potato, which is just pulled out of the ground. So what is the imagery? You know, the imagery associated with the touch. So when, we, we, you know, if it appeals to your eyes, then that's visual. If it appeals to your ears, we have different one. So when it comes to imagery, these are the things you have to know. Number one, visual. So these are the types of imagery that appeals to your sight or something to do with eyes, visual. So hearing auditory, that imagery is called auditory imagery, which appeals to your ears, like onomatopoeia, some kind of sound. Then olfactory imagery, you know, smell. Gustatory means taste, G-U-S-T-A-T-O-R-Y, tactile, touch. So this is the imagery used in Seamus Heaney's uh, digging. Loving their cool hardness in your hands as if we are able to touch the raw potatoes. So this imagery is uh, tactile. Then kinesthetic, K-I-N-E-S-T-H-E-T-I-C. Kinesthetic is some movement or bodily effort. So that is moment. Maybe I'm just blowing my nose or spitting. I'm running. Something with the movement or bodily effort is kinesthetic imagery. These are the major or these are the, I would say, 
uh, images, uh, types of imagery available. Visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, tactile, kinesthetic. Okay. So let's look at uh, a question from uh, net exam, uh, December 2024. Which of the following is not an example of kinetic imagery? There's nothing called kinetic. Maybe uh, kinetic is a synonym of kinesthetic here. Option A, unrolled his feathers. B, hopped sideways. C, velvet head. D, rolled him. So we have four options. One of them is not an example of kinetic imagery. First, you have to understand what a kinetic imagery or what kinetic imagery means. Kinetic has something to do with the movement. So option A, do we have movement here? Unrolled his feathers. There is some movement. B, hopped sideways. There is jumping. Look at the uh, fourth option, rolled him. There is movement. But C, velvet head is just a, you know, a description, visual imagery, right? So answer is C, velvet head is not an example of kinetic imagery. So hereafter in the upcoming net exams, if you get anything to do with the imagery, remember this visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, tactile and kinesthetic. Anyone can guess visual and auditory. You probably will get questions from these four. Olfactory, smell, gustatory, taste, tactile, touch, kinesthetic or kinetic movement. Okay. Next, let's focus on allusion. Uh, allusion is an indirect reference to another work or uh, something that is out of the text. You allude to something. Okay. You make references to something or someone that is allusion. When, it, when, I, when I think of allusion, one major writer which uh, comes to my mind uh, is a modern uh, a modernist poet whose famous work was published in 1922. Which modernist poet uh, am I referring to? Anyone? Known for, you know, that poem has five sections with, uh, often read as a T.S. Eliot. So, if at all, you know, someone is going to set a question uh, based on allusion, definitely that question uh, setter, uh, you know, will give some lines from T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, published in 1922, okay, which is uh, an example of modernist poetry. So we have few lines from uh, Wasteland. You, hypocrite lecter, mon resembler, mon frere, in the sense, you, hypocrite reader, uh, you know, my double, you look like me, my brother. So these are French, you know, words taken from the simplest poet, Charles Baudelaire, B-A-U-D-E-L-E-I-R-E, -E -E, from his famous book, Le Fleur du Mal. So anyone, you know, this famous simplest poetry, you know, it is a translated into English as, you know, the title, Le Fleur du Mal. The flowers of the mal is translated as in English, any guesses? Yes, Karunya, flowers of evil, evil, the flowers of evil. Very famous uh, poetry collection by French symbolist poet Charles Baudelaire. So here, T.S. Eliot takes the lines or borrows the lines, exactly the lines from Charles Baudelaire's text, Lay Flare the Mal. And this has a technical name. Anyone, uh, if a text referring to another text, it's called, you know, a uh, technical term by, coined by Julia Christopher. Inter, I'm just giving you clues. Inter, it's based on a concept called dialogism by Russian critic uh, Mikhail Bakhtin. Intertextuality is nothing. Uh, intertextuality, if a literary text refers to another literary, makes reference to another literary text, you know, through the title, with a, you know, or some passages or image that is called intertextuality. So generally when it comes to modernism, modern poems are filled with the intertextual references. Classic example is T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. I'm, you know, I'm not going through the entire Wasteland, but because it is full of intertextual references. Maybe let's uh, look at another example. The very first line, April is the cruelest month. So which alludes to? Very famous uh, poem, 
when it comes to english literature we talk about this poet father of english poetry and look at this picture you can guess there is a this cathedral is canterbury tales so canterbury tales april is the sweetest month written by chaucer in canterbury tales but april is the cruelest month so this is the line from uh, t s eliot okay let's focus on other uh, things sometimes the title itself you know alludes to a text for instance we have robert frost out out very famous poem where he talks about an accident uh, in which a boy accidentally cuts off his own hand you know it's a, a power saw accidentally that power saw uh, you know came to life and cut off his hand and the boy died so this incident disturbed robert frost so he wrote this poem at the word the saw as if to prove saws new what supper meant leaped out at the boy's hand or seemed to leap maybe you can read the entire poem later the title alludes to a particular a uh, play a tragedy by shakespeare you can guess can you guess out out where he talks about describes a life it's a soliloquy i'm just giving you clues s macbeth macbeth so s macbeth so towards the end comes out out right so maybe you can check it out the soliloquy by macbeth so this is allusion the title itself you know alludes to a famous uh, shakespearean play sometimes uh, allusion uh, can be about Uh, mythological creatures or something with the uh, mythology greek or latin mythology or indian mythology some mythological elements for instance we have silvia plot confessional poet uh, one of her famous poems fever 103 degree the tongues of hell are dull dull as the triple tongues of dull fat cerberus who wheezes at the gate so here we have the word uh, cerberus c r b r u s right so cerberus refers to a mythological creature a three headed dog which guards the gates of hell in greek mythology right it's a three headed dog that's why so we have you know the tongues of hell are dull dull as the triple tongues why triple tongue because this creature a three headed dog because it is a three headed dog it should have three tongues so the triple tongues of dull fat cerberus who wheezes at the gate all right so what you can do you should familiarize yourself with the, you know some of the famous uh, mythological creature for instance uh, uh, can you tell me the name of the winged horse in greek mythology a winged horse coming out of uh, medusa's head when she was uh, beheaded it's a winged horse also a symbol of uh, poetic inspiration it starts with the letter p s satya pegasus p g a s u s pegasus okay so check out uh, some of the mythological creatures or references okay next when it comes to poetry often you find symbols so let's focus on symbols symbols in the sense they are not direct they are conventional uh, they refer to something that happened or which uh, attained some connotation positive or negative or associated with something so let try to answer this question from june 2008 net symbolist movement was influenced by option a poetic theory of edgar allan poe b Stephen Mallarmé's poetry, C. Prose of Emerson, D. Ezra Pound's cantos. See, when we talk about symbolism as a movement, we generally go for French literature, right? But even French poets, symbolist poets, were influenced by a particular American poet who is known for using symbols. Option A. poetic theory of edgar allan poe so edgar allan poe was the one uh, known for using lot of symbols let's go you know let's uh, look at his famous poem the raven 
right? So in Raven, of course, it, this is an often asked question. So we have a Raven, a bird coming, uh, you know, uh, to the room of a scholar who has lost his lady love. And this bird repeats a particular word, a one word refrain. What is the word? One word, which it repeats. The scholar asks the question, it says, never more. Then he says, will I get relief? Never more. So one word refrain. And when it enters this room, it sits on or it perches on. So these are the lines. Perched upon a bust of pallas, just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. This is visually appealing because when we think of raven, we associate this symbol with, see, we, we watch a lot of uh, horror movies. When we watch horror movies, we are, you know, this symbol is used, raven, a crow, which symbolizes what do you think? I would say, number one, evil. Number two, it's some, you know, belief or superstition, right? But this creature is sitting on Pallas Athena. Goddesses Athena is a symbol of wisdom. Yes, it's a bad omen, right? So, raven is bad omen and it is associated with superstition. On the other hand, we have Pallas Athena, you know, because he is a scholar, right? So, Pallas Athena symbolizes wisdom. The scholar stands for wisdom, but after the death of his lady love, anyone knows the name of the lady love? After her death, you know, he goes mad. He starts believing in superstition. That's why he lost his reason. He abandoned the goddess of Athena. He started believing in superstition. Okay. So this is thematically, there is a contrast. And visually, there is a contrast because the bust of Pallas Athena is made of marble, white. So visually, we have white marble upon which we have a black raven. So contrast, white versus black, good versus evil. That contrast is also there. Okay. Yes, Lenore, uh, Rahika Prince. Good. Lenore, that's the name of the dead lady love. Okay. So when you read poems, so what I'm saying, for net exam or for that matter, I would say just to go through your BA and MA syllabus. Focus on the major poems and focus on the figures of speech used, symbols used, allusions used. Most of the time you get questions from, you know, prominent poems like Raven or any prominent poem. Even if you do not get lines from prominent poems, definitely you'll be able to guess there. Okay. And uh, how about AIDS, WB AIDS? So he used or he invented a symbol. Generally a symbol, uh, you know, it is already there. But sometimes the poets, they come up with their own personal symbol. They invent a symbol. For instance, we have gyre, G-Y-R-E, from the second coming by AIDS. What is a gyre? So we have two cones whose sharp ends are attached to each other and they revolve in opposite direction, anti-clockwise. It symbolizes two things. You know, it's about our life. Okay. One cone is our material aspect, the material aspect of life. We go after materialism, you know, things. And another is spiritualism. We try to find peace in life. So, you know, we are caught between these two. We have to earn money. We have to earn a lot of things. At the same time, we have to find peace. So, you are caught in this uh, eddy. So, that is gyre. Turning and turning in the widening gyre. There is no escape. So this is from WB AIDS. And there is a very famous uh, uh, prose work called The Simplest Moment in Literature by Arthur Simons. Who knows? Sometimes you can get direct questions like this. They may simply ask, who wrote the work The Simplest Moment in Literature? Arthur Simons. Arthur Simons, he dedicated this work to WB AIDS, by the way. Okay. Yes. Sayyid Ali Pazima. That's good. Next one. The Bog poems are associated with. This question is from December uh, 2005. Option A. Tedious 
B. Elizabeth Jennings. C. Tony Harrison. D. Seamus Heaney. Bog. B O G. Bog. Very famous. Yes, Seamus Heaney. When we say bog poems, bog it refers to in you know, a type of land, landscape. You know, when it comes to Ireland, what they dig, you know, peat, P E A T. Their soil is very fertile and uh, you can use it as a fuel, you know, bog. Now, this is peat. So, we, we in the picture, we see two old men digging, you know, peat, you know, in a, in a kind of a square one. They can sell it and use it for fuel. And these are some of the poems collectively called the Bog Poems by Seamus Haney. Bog Queen. Next, the Grobel, G R A U B A L L E, the Grobel Man. Next one, Punishment. Next, Strange Fruit. Next, Tollen Man, T O L L U N D. So, when you get questions, I mean, a uh, unique title like this, Tollen, T O L L U N D, Tollen Man, you can expect uh, these kind of questions. Maybe you can get a match, match the following. On the one side, you have a, uh, you have poems, on the other side, you have authors. Who knows, you might find this poem, Tall and Man. On the other side, if you find Seamus Heaney, match, and you can crack the question. So this is Bob. This question is from 2021. With which of the following moments is Charles Baudelaire's Flowers of Evil generally associated? So we have A, B, C, D. A, neoclassical. B, symbolist. C, modernist. D, postmodernist. Then choose the correct answer from the options given below. Number one, A and D only, in the sense neoclassical and postmodernist. B, uh, A and B only, in the sense neoclassical and symbolist. Then third one, B and C only, symbolist and uh, modernist. Then D, uh, C and D only, modernist and postmodernist. So you can easily eliminate option. We know Charles Baudelaire is a French, was a French symbolist poet. So definitely you will go for B. Right? You can eliminate two options. You are left with two options. A and B or C and uh, B and C. Which one? Definitely not neoclassical. Neoclassical age is something to do with uh, Dryden, Pope and Johnson. Definitely not A. Postmodernism, definitely not. So answer is B and C. In the sense, symbolist and modernist. Because symbolism is one of the modernist, it comes under modernism, one of the modernist movements. Okay. Next, finally, we are going to look at meter. So far, uh, we haven't got a lot of questions uh, from meter, but uh, standalone questions. We have a lot of standalone questions. Let's see. This is from July uh, 2016. Name the dominant meter of the following quatrain. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day. The lowing herd winds, uh, sorry, winds slowly over the lee. The plowman homewards floats his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Okay. So any guesses? These lines are by which poet? Very famous graveyard poet. This is from Elegy written in a country churchyard. Opening lines. So you have to find the dominant meter in this one. I, I can give you a clue. Simple clue. When it comes to English poetry, what is the dominant meter? English poetry. What is the dominant meter? So that is the dominant meter used uh, here by, uh, you know, Gray. Option A, iambic hexameter. B, trochaic pentameter. C, iambic pentameter. D, tersa rima. Answer is C, iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter is the commonest meter is the more uh, you know mostly used meter in english poetry so that is the answer but anyway let's look at what is this iambic meter see first you have to understand i'm not going to teach uh, all the things uh, but i can teach you often asked are the basic ones first one iambic when you say iambic you have two syllables the first syllable is unstressed the second syllable is stressed the exact opposite is trochaic. Two syllables. The first one is stressed. The second one is unstressed. Third is dactylic. Here we have three syllables. First one is stressed. The next two unstressed. Anapestic. We have three syllables. 
the first two unstressed third one is the last one is stressed just remember this one you know at least if you remember these four definitely you'll be able to crack you know questions based on uh, meter let's say what is iambic pentameter let's analyze that line the curfew told the knell of parting day what do you have to do first you have to mark which syllable is stressed or which one is unstressed so a simple uh, i can give you some tips number one when it comes to articles they are not stressed okay articles are not stressed a and the they are not stressed generally and prepositions they are not stressed okay and we have content words words with the intrinsic meaning they have stress so let's divide the we have article so unstressed next curfew 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 the first you know we have two syllables the first one is stressed second is unstressed then we have a verb which is which has some intrinsic meaning so it is stressed then we have the article so unstressed then nil uh, content word so stressed then we have of preposition unstressed then we have this uh, two syllabic word parting part is stressed the first one ing unstressed then finally we have a content word day stressed so we have totally 10 syllables decasyllabic so how do you uh, you know divide one two three four five we have five pairs so when we say five pairs of uh, you know syllables arranged in unstressed stressed syllable combination so unstressed uh, stressed that is iambic how many pairs five so totally penta so this is how you know iambic pentameter is created so if you have the simple understanding meter won't bother you okay so try to answer this question from june 2006 a metrical foot containing a stressed followed by an unstressed syllable is option a anapest b i am c trochee d dactyl what's the answer what's your answer very simple because we have only two syllables stressed unstressed so when we have two syllables focus on i am and trochee because others are three syllables so answer is c trochee t r o c h e e stressed followed by unstressed so go back go back to this slide see iambic unstressed stressed trochaic stressed unstressed dactylic stressed unstressed unstressed anapestic unstressed unstressed and stressed so remember these four these will help you crack a lot of questions based on a meter okay next one the elegy written in the country churchyard is written in this question from 2020 net exam option a quatrains of 10 syllable lines b octave and sestet c heroic couplet d alexandrines easy right in the sense most of the elegies are written in quatrains you know four lines so that's the answer option a quatrains of 10 syllable lines in the sense uh, quatrains in iambic pentameter definitely not option b octave and sestet the moment i say octave and sestet which uh, poetic form comes to your mind so we have octave eight lines then we have six lines sestet so totally 14 lines which sonnet or a sonnet a particular sonnet is a petrochan sonnet so we have petrochan sonnet octave plus sestet then heroic couplet when i say heroic couplet which two uh, you know english poets come to your mind neoclassical poets we have uh, dryden and pope dryden and pope heroic couplet again heroic couplet it's like tirukural tiruvalluvar's tirukural you have an idea or two ideas within these two lines the ideas they do not go out of the couplet heroic in a sense, uh, it's written in iambic pentameter and they rhyme. So, rhyming lines, two lines in iambic pentameter is called heroic couplet. Then, Alexandrin, which comes in a particular stanza, the stanza has nine lines. This is the ninth line. So, what stanza? 
is Spencerian stanza. So Spencerian stanza has nine lines and the ninth line, in the last line, has iambic hexameter, 12 syllables. So if a line has iambic hexameter instead of iambic pentameter, that line, particularly in uh, Spencerian stanza, is called Alexandrian. So if you are familiar with the, you know, all these things, I think the question is very easy for you. Okay. Next one. This is from December uh, 2005. A stanza of eight iambic pentameters on the pattern of A, B, A, B, A, B, C, C is known as option A, Rhyme Royal, B, Ottawa Rima, C, Tennysonian stanza, D, Spencerian stanza. I hope uh, most of you have eliminated option D because Spencerian is nine line stanza, definitely not D. Is it Rhyme Royal or is it B or C? Answer is B, Ottawa Rima, O-T-T-A-V-A, -T -T -A -A, Ottawa Rima. Um, Ottawa means, Ottawa Rima is eight, eight lines. Rhyme Royal, how many lines? It's also called a Chaucerian stanza. Rhyme Royal is also called a Chaucerian stanza. It's a seven line. It's a seven line stanza, also called a Chaucerian stanza. Ottawa Rima, eight. Then Spencerian, nine. What you can do? So when you take notes, you also write rhyme schemes. Who knows? Definitely there can be a question based on rhyme schemes. They, simp they can simply ask, what is the rhyme scheme of Rhyme Royal or Chaucerian stanza? What is the rhyme scheme of Ottawa Rima? Or what is the rhyme scheme of Spencerian stanza? So when you take notes, write Rhyme Royal, seven lines, rhyme scheme. Ottawa Rima, eight lines, rhyme scheme. Then Spencerian stanza, rhyme scheme. So you can use M. H. Abrams glossary and J. A. Cadden's uh, dictionary for this purpose. Next one, uh, metrics. See, I am not able to teach everything related to metrics. Uh, you know, just uh, a one-hour webinar. But if you are interested in learning about uh, figure of speech and metrics, you know, something uh, you know, a meter, please uh, buy this book or get this book and read this book. Elements of English Rhetoric and Prosody by Bose and Sterling. This is the book uh, with which I taught myself uh, rhetoric and prosody. Very simple with a lot of examples uh, in this book, Rhetoric and Prosody. What is the rhetoric art of public speaking? Here it refers to use of uh, figures of speech and other rhetorical elements. Then prosody refers to the use of meter in poetry. So this is the best book to learn or master, you know, basic uh, poetic terms uh, related to rhetoric and prosody. Okay. So with this, I end today's session, this webinar. And as I told you before, there's a special offer in the last net exam, June 2024. If you qualified in PhD only, then just to send your scorecard and you can join our course on uh, UGC net and uh, set any, you know, any subject, English management, commerce, economics, any subject, 50% off. And you can call this number 7070701005 uh, or 7070101009. That's one. And there are also books for paper one. There are five books for paper one. If you join the course, it's uh, it will come with that one. Then for English, we have 10 books uh, for poetry, you know, each and every unit you can use. Okay. So with this, we finish uh, this webinar. I hope this is useful for you. And go through this uh, webinar and whatever we have discussed and also the books. Thank you.